So, on to the, this, um, the main part of the evening. Very happy to be able to introduce uh, the two people who will be participating. Um, we ha uh, are welcoming Seth Shostak. He'll be uh, performing an inter onstage interview. Uh, Seth is the Senior Astronomer and Fellow at the SETI Institute in Mountain View. He's conducted radio astronomy research on galaxies for much of his career, and he's written over 500 articles and web stories on topics in astronomy, technology, film, and television. Seth chaired the International Academy of Astronautics SETI Permanent Committee for a decade, and he hosts SETI's weekly hour-long science radio show titled Big Picture Science. He'll be interviewing Professor Hildreth Hal Walker, Jr., and um, he'll be in conversation with him here on the stage. Uh, Hal installed the radio, the radar systems in fighter planes during the Korean War, worked on the ballistic missile early warning system, and also worked on the first satellite-based TV transmission in 1962. He later joined CORAD, where he led the manufacturing, testing, and operation of their Ruby laser system um, in the Apollo 11 experiment that we'll be celebrating tonight. He's also the guy who actually fired the laser multiple times before it actually hit Peter exactly 50 years ago tonight. Hal is here with his wife, Dr. Betty Walker, and she has her own interesting story as a pioneer of STEM education and outreach. She's, uh, she's with us here in the front row and I have a feeling that Hal just might talk about her during part of the, our conversation. So let's welcome Seth and Hal to the stage. Let me introduce my wife here. She'll be helping me with this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Betty Walker. Raise your hand. Up. And, if I, and if I say something wrong, she'll very quickly let you know I did. Okay, all right. Kid. Okay. Well, I, I want to start out by saying how uh, uh, lovely and wonderful it is to be here at this IEEE uh, time in the celebration. Uh, as we all know, 50 years ago, uh, Many of us gathered there at Lick Observatory uh, to attempt the uh, first uh, laser ranging experiment with the accuracy we had anticipated. Because, of course, we were not the first people to fire a laser to the moon. Uh, many uh, other uh, research institutes had fired lasers previously, and, of course, uh, that light was very random, reflections and so forth, so the accuracy of that was suspect. Now, what we wanted to do, of course, is with my life, I want to start by saying uh, my involvement started out as a young, young man, young boy. Uh, I, I grew up in the uh, South. Uh, I was born, for I think for everybody's uh, information or uh, milestone, I was born in 1933 in New Orleans, Louisiana. So of course, uh, in those years, uh, things like lasers or going to the moon were not even a, a topic. But there was Buck Rogers. I started reading Buck Rogers magazines as soon as I could count to 10. <laughs> okay. But here's what happened that was so important in my career. My dad, when I was eight years old, uh, of course, we might remember many of us back in the day, Daisy air rifles were quite popular. So, of course, when I got old enough to get a, a rifle I, or some type of a weapon, I asked my dad for a Daisy uh, pump a rifle. And of course, I was all excited about that. He said, yeah. But then when I went to him to get the, the gift, it was in a brown bag about yay big. Today, they would probably call it cocaine, but it was about that, something like that. So I reached, I, I was very disappointed. I mean, to have, a, to have a Daisy BB gun was, you were like the top guy on the block. I reached in and pulled it out. It was a Buck Rogers ray gun. And I've always mentioned this when I talk about my life story, that you have to be very careful what you put in a child's hand. Because <laughs> when I pulled the trigger, there wasn't BBs coming out, it was the little sparks. And I always want to say I followed those sparks all my life. And it took me to Apollo 11 with the biggest laser in the world at that time. <laughs> The, the type of laser that um, we were operating there, and I always want to mention this because we were using a weapons-grade laser. I want to say that very quietly, weapons-grade laser. Uh, <laughs> because in those days, if you mentioned something like that, uh, uh, people got excited. 
uh, because again, the beam and the ray was uh, sort of like, a, how, how much damage can you do with a thing like this? So of course, my friend, uh, the inventor of the laser, Ted Maymer, we all got to be friends, is working at Corad Lasers in 19, early 1960s. Uh, Ted, when asked uh, about this problem of the laser, uh, said, well, look, the, la the laser is a solution looking for a problem. Well, of course, his uh, management at Hughes Aircraft Company's research labs thought this was a wonderful idea, the laser. Let's go down and take a look at it, Ted. So when they went down to the lab and laser, and Ted finally went, what, <laughs> what are we going to do with that? So, of course, Ted got very uh, ticked off, to make a long story short, and uh, uh, retired from Hughes Aircraft Company. Started his own company called Corad lasers. And for all of you all here tonight that have read that word in, the, in the, some of the write-ups you've seen, you probably want to know what CORAD means. It means coherent radiation. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. That's what that is. So any, anytime in the future you'll be an expert on CORAD. But that company started to um, bring together just talented individuals from across the spectrum, electronics, physics, uh, you name it, cooling systems, so forth and so on. And our first job, of course, was to start to get involved in scientific research programs with a small laser that did about one joule. This laser was pumped with 5,000 joules of an input, ruby pulse laser, 6943 angstrom output. And of course, this was used quite extensively around the country. My role at that time at CORAD was I was the op field operations manager for CORAD and also ran the manufacturing department for CORAD's laser manufacturing. Because again, we felt that the person that knew how to build it should go operate it, because at that time, no one was really that familiar with it, because most of our researchers were guys that stood around scratching their heads about what was wrong. So the guys that built these things got to be the experts. I was known at one time, I guess we've probably been roughly around, uh, I'd say, uh, 67 or so, I'd probably fired more laser shots than anybody on the, on the planet. Because again, my, I fired lasers every day all day. That was one. Of, that was my job. Now that all leads me. That leads us again to why I was one of the guys that ended up at Lick Observatory. No one in the world had fired more laser shots than me. Or maybe some guys could have tried to know about them. But at that time, that was my reputation. I won't go to what they call me, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> that was one of the things I took credit for. But again, the laser at Lick very quickly was a K fifteen hundred. You've heard us describe it and, re and read about it. It was a multi stage device. Uh, using uh, synthetic ruby crystals. It was a two-stage unit that an oscillator had developed about one joule or so on the output of that. And of course, it had an amplifier that had a 10-inch, half-inch crystal inside the amplifier. We pumped that section with 25,000 joules. Now, you might say, why were we putting that much power input to a laser that could only get out about 12 joules? Well, ruby was one of the most inefficient <laughs> mediums that was around in those days. That's why we had to go to YAG and neodymium later on in years. But again, uh, we brought that type of a laser here to Lick, and prior to that, I was mentioned earlier, was a weaponized system. We, were, we developed it for Kirtland Air Force Base using some of their uh, research there. I'm sure you know what I mean. But uh, once the uh, mission to the moon was uh, developed by some very nice guys, one of them sitting right here in the front row, raise your hand, Joe. <laughs> and, and, and Dr. Fowler, who's not here with us tonight, I understand he's overseas. But uh, I always say to my audience when I speak that other people came up with the idea to do this. I was busy doing a lot of other things. And of course, uh, when, the, I, when the suggestion was made that we would use a laser, to uh, do a ranging experiment. Now, who else would they ask but me to come and do it for them? So I said, great, I'll do that for you. So we, I pulled together a team, and we built three lasers over the, over the past, leading up to Apollo 11. Three lasers were built, primarily for doing one from Haleakala. Uh, classified work, which I'll describe, was basically blinding Soviet uh, uh, satellites. <laughs> that was interesting. We had a lot of fun doing that. So they figured out how to stop it. But anyway, that was another story. But when, when it came time to go to the moon, we said, well, wait a minute. Joe and the guy said, wait a minute. If the, if the laser reflector is put down in a certain place, and maybe dust and other things get on it, so forth and so on, all these problems may come up. We got to try to find this thing. So of course, uh, we scratched our heads and talked about it and chose to use this K-1500 
as the acquisition later. And I want to make one thing sort of to everybody's knowledge. Our job at Lick Observatory was just to find the reflector. We were on a search mission. We were not there to necessarily find out how far away the moon was or to find out what the, 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 the benefits of laser ranging and ultimate, none of that. My job was to run a laser that had satisfactory power to reach the moon, search for the reflector, which in case, as we know from one of the discussions earlier, they did not quite land where they anticipated. Now, we had characterized the surface area around the hope you see it tranquility, that that base, what the base would happen for some weeks leading up to it. So when the laser, when uh, Neil Armstrong sort of took control, I was sitting there watching him on screen. I said, oh my goodness, look what he's doing. He's flying away somewhere. Where'd he go? <laughs> so, so I said, well, oh, let's start looking for him. And of course, that was our next mission now. Go and actually find where the reflector was located. In the meantime, I had a second laser we had built at Corad that was being, uh, I think we'll, saw it, we'll see it in a film uh, in, a, in a slide later. It was a much more powerful laser than the one I had, but its purpose was it could develop more pulses per minute than we could. We could only fire one shot per minute. One gigawatt, 12 joules, 10 nanoseconds was the pulse length. And so therefore to us, that was about the extreme of what we could produce. However, the lasers we built at McDonald were able to run at much higher repetition rates and so forth. So that was my colleague uh, there operating that laser, Jim Myers. And I want to mention his name tonight because many of these gentlemen that were working very extensively in this program are now deceased. It's been a long time. I just thank God that I'm, I'm still here to talk about it a little bit. But uh, Irv Weiner, again, uh, as many of us know it, here at Lick, was a very prime uh, participant in that, in that uh, activity there. We want to mention him. He's deceased now. And of course, Jim Myers was operating the laser at McDonald Observatory. And of course, another colleague of mine, Bill Rundle, was operating a laser from Haleakala that was in a classified state that I, I don't necessarily talk that much about. But that was kind of what made up the American presence for the Operation Lure uh, in 1969. Okay. <laughs> sort of an introduction. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn on this feedback device. Okay. All right. Well, we have plenty of time here. So I'm going to go through some of these questions here that uh, Brian asked. But, you know, maybe for historical purposes, with what accuracy, when you finally got around to measuring the distance of that corner reflector on the moon, uh, you know, to begin with, you're not going to get a whole lot of photons back, no. even with your your your... 12 joule laser. How many photons would you get back typically? Well, I, I in think we were talking about looking for like three to five. Three to five. five okay. Five or six. You know, something like that. Four, maybe a fourth. <laughs> yeah, three. Four. Three, yeah. four. <laughs> and getting far more infrared the, the, photons the, here the, in this room. Doing, doing our talk like this, I'll try to interrupt our, you know, our, 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 our futile pointers. One of the things that happened uh, after, uh, after we had got operating, because again, you, you, you just imagine, most of our technical institutions all across America had participated in some degree to build a device or apparatus that could be used as part of this system. The laser was just the source. In the meantime, MIT built the receivers and somebody else did something else over here. So, uh, we unfortunately damaged the MIT receiver after about a couple of days, and of course, uh, uh oh, now what do we got to do? Cold War problem pops up. Call comes. Hey guys, the Russians are lazing on the moon, and if they find the reflector for before we do, who's going to be responsible for the thirty-five billion we spend to get there? Not me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So, so there, was a, there was an aspect of the, uh, the moon race yes. that you were involved with. Now, I mean, those astronauts took four days to get to the moon. You took about one and a half seconds. That, that, that's clearly an improvement. What were the Russians doing? <laughs> I mean, you know, how far did they get? They didn't beat you. Well, they, they actually landed. I think this is true. I've read it someplace. They actually landed. Luke and Lloyd one or two a day before we got there, I think. Was just, they had a that, reflector. Anyone can say a yay or nay? Three days before Apollo 11 landed, the Russians landed a French-Russian thing that had a, a, a mirror on it, whatever it was. I never saw it personally. But they got into a, uh, a ditch, <laughs> we'll call it. 
and could, couldn't get their reflector to look back in the right direction. But we did find it for them later and told them where it was, but that's another story. <laughs> I'm sure they were grateful. Uh, <laughs> okay, so so you finally fire this thing up. You you send a lot of pulses. I assume you're just averaging all the the returns so that yes. uh, you're only getting a couple of photons, right? So you build up the signal noise. Uh, now. You know, the distance of the moon, I mean, that was a project that interested the Greeks about 1,200 years ago, and they did it too, but without lasers, uh, they couldn't afford them. And they, <laughs> but they did measure them, you know, just the curvature of the shadows oh, during yeah. eclipses and so on. And, and they got, that got a number that was right to within a factor of two, and as Mike Bolte will tell you, in astronomy, a factor of two is pretty good accuracy. But by the 1950s, I mean, they, you know, there were other parallax methods, just geometry, if you will, and Greeks yeah. again. Uh, that measured the distance to the moon to about a mile, plus or minus a mile. You did three orders of magnitude better than that. Yes, and I think one of the guys in the uh, movie was trying to describe that, but uh, I, think, I think we resolved it in some of the initial returns when we, when was, once we found it to like maybe four, three, four, five meters or something like that. And subsequently, the McDonald team is able to reduce that distance down to seven. Al, do you have any idea how accurately this can be done today? Well, unfortunately, they've, they've terminated the, uh, uh, the laser ranging experiments now at uh, McDonald's. It's all over with now. It, it's been, there was no uproar over it. I was surprised, but I guess after 40 years, somebody said, I, I was at a conference here just a month ago. Okay. And, and I was speaking, and, and a gentleman comes to the mic and he says, what, Hal, what was one of the benefits that you all got from lunar laser ranging? I said, well, one of the things we find is that the moon is traveling away from the Earth at three or four uh, uh, inches a year. He said, I ain't very much. I said, well, what would it, what would it be like when it was coming to orders? <laughs> yeah, but it moves, around, it moves away from us at, what, about an inch a year or something? Yeah, something like that. 